Okay. Uh, good. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I guess I'm going to get started. So I am Thibaut Saunier, um, a multimedia engineer at Igalia, doing some consultancy uh, around JStreamer, and in particular, uh, I'm developing the video editing stack in JStreamer. So uh, as I'm used to, I'm going to do an update about uh, everything that is happening on that part of, of the JStreamer stack. Uh, oh, one second. Anyway, okay. So just a quick uh, history of the editing stack in JStreamer. So it was started uh, pretty early in the development of the project in 2001. Uh, Wim Tayman started the Gnolin set of uh, elements. So the Gnolin plugin, which uh, introduces like the, the lowest level primitives to do video editing based on, on the, on the JStream infrastructure. Um, it was pretty hard to use. And in 2009, we decided to work on, on some higher level API, uh, library that is called the JStream editing services that uh, reuse uh, Gnolin, used to use Gnolin at that point. And then a new major version of the uh, Gnolin plugin was uh, built. Um, it's like a big refactoring um, of Knollin, uh, fixing tons of uh, threading issue mainly. And uh, we called it the Nonlinear Engine, which is a new uh, plugin. Um, that's, I will just show the architecture. Um, so we have just stream editing services, which is a library. Uh, it exposes like high level primitives such as a clip. Uh, layers. It allows you to do um, asset management, like handling proxies, so you have several versions of the same uh, asset and things like that. Um, and then you have the GS pipeline, which is a simple uh, pipeline that you can use to build uh, your application. And inside the stream editing services, now we put the nonlinear engine plugin. It, you can use it separately, but it's still inside the, the just stream editing services project. Um, and that implements like the low-level primitives of, of video editing in JStreamer. I will describe a bit how it works so that I can explain uh, what we've been working on. So, JStreamer editing services. So, uh, it's a library with uh, bindings for many languages. Uh, nowadays, most people use it from Rust and the new application that are being built with uh, GS are written in Rust, uh, but well, historically, people were using JS with uh, Python a lot. We have an application that do that. BTV is a video editing uh, software that uh, using GTK, and that was built in Python, so that's also very well tested. Um, and you can use it in C Sharp, but that's less tested. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can build simple editing application quickly, easily, but really the goal is that you can build a full uh, pro-grade video editing application on top of the streamer. And the big advantage of that is that um, you can reuse all the JStream ecosystem. For example, you can stream a, a timeline real time uh, using some uh, WebRTC, WebRTC bin or WebRTC sync uh, after, the, after the timeline. And uh, you can, uh, for example, use uh, dash stream as input. You can use like whatever we support in JStreamer. You can just use it uh, like with, with the gesture editing services. So um, it's very powerful. Indian. So in terms of uh, the, the, the primitives that we expose, uh, we have so the timeline, which is the main object, uh, where you just put your clips inside. And then you have the notion of projects that you can serialize that bundles also the assets that are part of the project. So the assets are basically the files that you have uh, anywhere, the streams. Uh, and then we have the notion of layers so that uh, you can, in, in general, that's what we call tracks in the, in the video editing uh, uh, world. But here it's called layers, which is very similar to layers in uh, image editing uh, applications. So you have, that's how you define what will be mixed with what in terms of like you have the first layer where you have a video and it will be mixed with a, a video that, has, that is on the second layer, etc. And then you have the tracks, which are basically, they are just they are, uh, just streamer bins, which will expose one pad per track, and the pad, so you will have one video track and one audio track, 
and or you can have like several uh, video tracks if you want, and several audio tracks that you edit in parallel, and it exposes one pad on each uh, for each track. So in the JS timeline, you will have well uh, one pad per track. So I'm going now to uh, describe a bit more what has happened in the last four years. Um, quite a few features have been implemented. Uh, speed control. We have been working on like exposing, implementing like the basic features inside the streamer for a long time, but recently we took the time to actually uh, implement support for s controlling the playback speed of each source uh, inside the inside the GS uh, and NLE. And uh, I will describe a bit what implication it has on the on the on the uh, project. Um, I will. So we have, we have been having a smart rendering for a long time, but it was only for MPEG-2, uh, H.263, uh, <laughs> so very old uh, codecs, and nowadays we're able to do... So I will explain a bit what smart rendering is about. It's like uh, you are able to um, um, just render some clips one after the other without doing compositing or anything, and without decoding, decoding them. So basically you can uh, put in a timeline a source like two source one after the other, you say I want to play that source from uh, five seconds to ten seconds, then this other source from ten to twenty seconds, whatever, uh, and we will just render it without re-encoding anything, and making sure that uh, it's precisely cutting, so that if uh, at you have, so we we <laughs> we uh, cut at five seconds. If at five seconds uh, you have no keyframes, we will just. Uh, uh, re-encode like the parts that are needed to be re-encoded and put the put the the encoded stream where possible. So we re-encode only the parts that are really required to be re-encoded, uh, which is <laughs> has a lot of complex implication in, in terms of implementation, the background. But uh, yeah, it's working very well. And thanks to Bicast with uh, recording the video today, uh, we have been able to make it working in most cases, which is already nice. Uh, we, we have a set of, of codecs that we support, which is basically H.264, H.265, and VP8. <laughs> uh, we have been working on uh, discover serialization. Uh, basically, when you discover an asset, it takes some time because... So basically, the process of discovering an asset is uh, reading the headers, but in the streamer, we actually do some decoding, and it's about, like... Uh, detecting what is the frame rate of the video, what is the size of the video, etc., and what what stream a video contains. And to do video editing, you need to know all that uh, beforehand, so that you can uh, select. I mean, you you have you need that information to build your timeline, right? So uh, right now, instead of discovering all the time, uh, each time you have, each time you load a project, we're able to serialize the information, and then you can reload it much faster. And uh, in complex projects, it was taking ages to just load all the information, uh, reading all the files on disk, and now we can just like ju just grab the serialization and it just works. Um, we have been working on stabilizing uh, nested timelines. So a nested timeline is like you have a source, uh, a GS source that actually contains a, a timeline inside of it. I will explain a bit how it works um, later. And we have implemented that just before last conference, I think, and we have been stabilizing it and doing this kind of new use cases with, uh, with it uh, recently. Um, and yeah, I will describe a bit that. And another feature that we have been uh, working on is uh, hardware acceleration. So we are now able to use hardware accelerated elements uh, inside, uh, inside uh, GS, so for compositing, but for also for um, color space conversion and all that. So, yeah, big, big progress here. Um, so speed control, I think that's the first uh, feature we have landed um, in those years. So it's about uh, changing the, 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 playback, the playback rate of, um, of the sources. It has tons of implication because, for example, if you seek, uh, you seek an element like video rate, so we know in the video rate element you can have a rate property that allows you to say, okay, I want to play that stream uh, twice, twice, twice as fast. Um, and when you do that, uh, it will just like drop the frames that it needs and and, and re and re timestamp everything. And uh, it has to handle the fact that 
well, you want to seek from 5 seconds to 10 seconds, let's say. Uh, that's the seek, what it says. It has to ask upstream, like from, um, well, in that case, it, it will be 10 to, to uh, 20. <laughs> so that it, it has the, the enough media from upstream uh, to be able like, to produce the stream that you asked for, right? Um, and it has to update the, it update the seek, uh, send the new segments that has updated values because of that, and uh, that has tons of implication in terms of uh, how do we handle that at the, at the edition level, because like, the clips, if it's going to play, be played twice as fast, um, well, it doesn't have, like, the, it, can, it can last for, instead of, like in the timeline, instead of lasting for its, max, it, its full length is one minute, it will be at most like 50 se uh, 30 seconds, right? So uh, in terms of APIs, we have to properly think this kind of, of details, like how do we expose that to the user, uh, how we, be we behave internally for uh, handling those hedge cases. And, uh, and that has implication in a, in the, at the lowest level, which is NLE. And that has uh, made us like uh, make our life more complex for optimizing the, the NLE level, and I will explain a bit more uh, what that means in practice. So for nested timeline, as I was saying, a lot of stabilization. Uh, so nested timeline, yeah, it allows you like, to, the, to uh, better organize the way you do the, your edits, so you can have some people working on some part of the timeline and then just import it as a project in another timeline that will uh, handle all the sequences that you have uh, inside your project and uh, so splitting timeline complexity and it allows for example to render just parts of the timeline so uh, I will explain that use case that was quite interesting that we worked on uh, recently and I think there are uh, other people that might be interested with that um, basically if you have a timeline with uh, one source that lasts for 10 seconds, then you have another source that lasts for, uh, for that, that we have from uh, second two to second four, and then we have some effects. And what we want is basically render only uh, from the third second to the fifth second, uh, no, for a duration of five seconds, sorry. That's what that diagram says. Uh, you can just save the timeline that you have, like the main one, then you create a new timeline which has a, a new source with an endpoint of three seconds so that it will just start using the file. Well, in that case, the file is describing the timeline, so it's the timeline uh, from three seconds, and it will last for uh, five seconds. So that you end up with a stream after the second timeline here. You will have a stream that is basically the first timeline, but only the, 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 the part of it that you are interested about. Uh, and that can be used, for example, um, in that case for rendering uh, in parallel in, in, in many servers, like uh, chunks of a dash stream or things like that, uh, and from, from uh, actually complex timelines, making your life quite easy because otherwise you will have like, to rebuild the timeline and it's just not possible. <laughs> uh, um, so that, do things I've landed already. Um, I wanted to talk about a bit about um, things that are still in progress. Uh, so mostly what we, I, th I think like in terms of features, we are quite complete these days. Uh, I'm, I still have a few features I would like to work on and finalize. Uh, like reverse playback of sources, it's still not possible while it's not so advanced use case. Like you want to play back some sources in your timeline from end to beginning, basically. Um, we have some work that is done. It kind of works, but uh, well, needs, needs some tweaking here and there. Um, but yeah. And so what we have been mostly working on uh, recently is uh, optimization. So the first part of it was uh, investigating where performances were uh, lacking, let's say. Um, and what I discovered during the process, I wanted to share it with you because I think it's, it's really useful, is the, the uh, new um, tracer uh, from Standard AI that allows you to uh, like leverage the whole uh, Rust tracing ecosystem. So in Rust, you have a tracing um, crate that is really, really good, and you have tons of other crates that allows you like, to reuse, uh, well, to do like 
proper performance uh, analysis, let's say. Uh, for example, I have, I have uh, implemented just uh, tracing Chrome support, which was like just reuse the crate and, uh, <laughs> and, and work with it. And it allows you to, do, to get some, some graph like uh, this one, where i uh, not sure it's really readable, is it? Wow. I guess it's fine. Where you can basically uh, see the flow, flow graph of everything that is happening. So here, for example, you can, well, it's not the best example. I had better ones. So here, for example, you can just check uh, some elements. So it's, it's uh, one, one row is a, is a thread, right? And, uh, and here you can see like the time that it took for uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, some weird, weirdly named element. <laughs> Uh, let's pick another one. Uh, okay, could I download to go from post to ready? And it took uh, 294 milliseconds, which is a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, it's, very, it's very simple to graphically see what time is spent and all that. And that's something I think we are lacking. We were lacking because I think that is a tool that is really useful. And uh, I'm sure there are tons of other crates that you can use uh, with that tracer. Uh, to do like benchmark analysis and all that and performance analysis. Anyway, um, so <laughs> I will go with uh, the main performance issue that we have been solving uh, right, well, that we are solving right now. Um, so for that, I will explain a bit how uh, the Anneli composition works. So, uh, so the Anneli composition is a bin which uh, holds a reference to um, different uh, sources or operations, right? And the sources have a uh, start time, uh, an in-point time, and a duration. Well, here we don't really care about in-point. Um, so here, for example, we have a composition where you have one source that lasts from the beginning to the end. Uh, then at the second, sec at the second second, uh, you have another source. And then you have, uh, during the whole duration of the timeline, you will always have a composition, a compositor element. Well, usually. Um, so that uh, you can mix things together, mix videos and all that, right? Um, so, how it works? Um, for example, you start, you start playing back that composition, so you will start at, uh, well, the second zero, and uh, the compositor will look at the elements that, the composition, sorry, will look at the elements that, are, uh, that it has to pick to play back from zero to two seconds. Here we see that uh, here it will pick like the first source, so that a stack a stack is basically the set of elements that you use at any point in time when when you when you play back the when you play back the composition right uh, so here it will just pick the first source and it, it will see that you have uh, the compositor to plug, so it will just have basically those elements uh, now inside the source you can put whatever you want uh, any gesture element it has to has one, sync pad, one source pad, that's the only uh, restriction it has. Well, it's a source. Um, and, well, there is another priority inside the NLE object also that uh, allows the composition to know in what order to plug what. So you can build a graph uh, based on only on, on the priority information. So then you go to the second stack from two seconds to four seconds. It goes like, okay, I will pick uh, the source. Oh, there is another source, and then there is a compositor. I will just be that simple uh, stack, right? And it go iteratively like, oh, I reached that moment in time. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention also is that um, to to get a new stack started, right now what we do is we pre-roll the stack. So we wait for the source path to receive a buffer, and then we seek it the way we need it, so that uh, each source will go and and check what frame it has to display. Uh, based on where we are in the playback. So if it has in point, it will just like have some other values. And if you have uh, uh, effects that do uh, rate control, it will get different, different, um, different uh, seek values, right? Um, and so it's, yeah. So you have that back and forth uh, thing where it pre-rolls, then you get seeked, and that's not really optimal. And then, yeah, full stack, same thing. Uh, it it checks, uh, well, the, second, the third will 
not be interesting. The force, you just, uh, you, you get the logic, right, I guess. So here it goes and, and build the, the next stack. Um, and one thing that is really important when you do video editing is that when you are editing, you, want, you often, often want to like scrub around the timeline, seeing what is happening where, um, what should I do with that clip. So to make decisions, you need to have a good overview of what is happening and when in the timeline. And what you want for that is to be able to like scrub around and that you have a, like as fluid as possible stream inside the viewer when you are doing that, right? So hopefully you have like a perfect stream with a, a good frame rate inside the, inside the viewer uh, when scrubbing around. But uh, right now, with the way it's done, there is no optimization and it's quite slow. Like you always have, especially if you uh, go from one stack to the other, uh, we have to build a stack, wait for it to pre-roll, seek again, so yeah. Uh, the idea we come up with is uh, we should be able like, to start pre-rolling uh, the next, the clips, <laughs> sorry. We should be able to pre-roll uh, the, the, the medias that we are going to use or that we might use if the user goes after, well, before or after, right? So uh, we, have a, we have implemented a UI decode pool source, um, and that is another variant of uh, splitting gestural pipelines, uh, which is a very common um, pattern that we have now in Gestreamer. Uh, I think we have a talk after about like what what that pattern implies, why do we do that, etc. Because it, it it's actually quite useful to decouple like um, the pipelines where we are decoding from uh, the actual like uh, pipeline where we are doing the the video editing. And oh, no, not thank you yet. Uh, <laughs> La, la, la. Here we go, sorry. Um, so that's how it works. It's pretty simple. So you have a pool of pipelines, which is an object uh, that you can access actually from the UI decode pool source. Uh, the important element here is this one. That's UI decode pool source. That's the new element uh, I'm talking about. So basically, instead of, UI, of using UI decode bin, you will use UI decode pool source. And uh, it allows you like uh, to avoid destroying pipelines. Yeah, I, there, are, there are more use cases. I've, I've, I've used that pattern for other use cases. But, uh, so it will be, uh, it, well, it is an element that is implemented in Rust, and uh, we want to upstream that in GST plugin Ceres. Um, so basically, it will, retain the, it, it will retain the pipelines in the background, so they can be reused uh, for a certain amount of time, or the user can decide like have a very fine grain control over uh, the 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 sorry the pipeline that are uh, used in the in the pipe in the in the pool right um, so yeah so um, to be able to have like very precise uh, control over the pipelines that we need inside uh, NLE. We have a new GS pipeline, uh, pipeline pool manager in GS, which will try to uh, start the pipelines that might be used um, if if the user starts seeking, or even like if we go from if the user is just uh, playing back, we'll go from one stack to the other. But in the background, the next the next uh, with the next, it depends on on the, we have to find the right balance between uh, how many pipelines in the background do we want and, uh, and how much resources it's going to consume. Like find, finding the right balance for, for that is quite complex. Uh, right now we have simple, uh, simple implementation, I'll say. So we have a window. So for example, we'll say, um, I will just grab uh, 10 seconds or 20 seconds Ensure that before the current stack and the next, and uh, before the current stack, I have 10 seconds that are ready to be played, and and, and, and 10 seconds, yeah, 10 seconds to be played. Um, so you have n pipelines running parallel there, and when, uh, yeah. Um, so that's what I'm explaining here, <laughs> and uh, there is one optimization that uh, I started to say it was hard to implement because of the way. Uh, speed control uh, is done, is starting to seek the sources right when you relink them. So basically, uh, when we, right now, we uh, build the, the stack, we wait for the first buffer, and we seek. So that's like a come and go 
thing that is not ideal. Uh, but uh, we can now like uh, if if there is no if there is no um, rate changing effects in the timeline, we can directly uh, seek the elements right from the start, like the sources. We'll just like when we link the source, we just seek it with the right seek, and then we don't have to do the pre-rolling and all that. So it's much faster. And with that, uh, and with the playbin pool, we're able to have uh, performances when seeking between stack that is very similar to when seeking inside the stack, because basically it's just one seek that happens on some sources that was already ready because it was uh, in the pool of uh, pre-rolled uh, pipelines. And uh, it's pretty good. Um, OK, I will go fast. <laughs> So here, well, same thing, but uh, explaining how it works inside GS, right? Um, so you have uh, the real decode pool source. Uh, you have everything that is pre-rolled and ready uh, in the background. And, uh, yeah. and the next thing that we've been working on is uh, full hardware acceleration support. So uh, right now, it's already possible to use a whatever mixer you want. Um, just setting the, the, the mixer you want rank to something that is higher to the compositor one, because by default it will pick the, the compositor. And, uh, well, if you want to use the GL mixer, you just, set the, you just uh, bump the rank of the GL mixer and GS will start using it. And that's already like uh, making a, a big difference in terms of uh, performances while compositing, but there is still a big issue because we, you won't be able to have from uh, from the decoder, that's the main use case, I think. The decoder is actually op outputting the, 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 the frames in, a, in a hardware memory, right? And then uh, we would like to have all the processing happening in that memory. Uh, right now, inside GS, we, we add uh, color spec conversion elements. Uh, we add a video flip elements. Uh, so, so that we can do the right thing, right? Uh, like scaling has necessary because well, the user has for it, et cetera. And we added, uh, uh, we implemented, we re-implemented, well, yeah, the noto video convert element that was not functional. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, it was, yeah, it, it was not, it was not really thought for uh, handling hardware uh, encoding, I mean, hardware-based elements. So now we have, well, it's still to be merged upstream, but uh, it's working decently well. Um, auto, auto, uh, Auto, uh, auto video convert, uh, auto video scale, auto video dentalize, and auto video flip elements. Those, those elements will just plug the right element depending on the memory that is being used uh, uh, by the source. So if you need, if you have a, a, a decoder that, uh, that decodes in some GL memory, uh, it will negotiate, the auto convert elements will negotiate like, oh, okay, I will plug uh, the GL converter, right? Or, and, and then uh, everything happens in that, uh, in that memory. So you don't have to download, upload, and all that. So, yeah. And it's all automatic and it just works. So, uh, I would like to introduce a, a quick demo of the new uh, product that uh, is being developed, which is basically uh, um, video editing software uh, all running in the browser. With GS running in the GS running uh, on the server, I, I will let Luke uh, explain. Thanks, Steve. I'll keep it brief because I know we're we're running we're running low on time. But I'm super excited to give you guys a sneak preview of Sequence. It's a browser slash cloud based video editor that we've built using GStreamer over the past few years, um, and you can actually you see can right now. Tiba just loaded this up on his screen, and we actually have a timeline running inside the browser, being fully rendered in the cloud, streamed back to his browser. And what's cool is I actually opened up this page on my laptop too, and we have full multiplayer support. So you can actually have multiple people in a project working together um, in real time editing. So it's, it's, it's been a really, really ambitious project, but we're really excited to continue working with the GStreamer community, continue uh, upstreaming different patches and working on improving all the elements that we use. So we're super stoked. Um, thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for not letting more time to present that. But <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, if you have 
one question or two, maybe? Maybe later. Some other time. <laughs> uh. Okay. Thank you then.